Revelation chapter 4. I call this message, Why I Believe in the Pre-Tribulation Rapture of the Church. So I'm going to do kind of a topical message today. And really, the subtitle would be, Why This is Important to You. We're going to talk about what happens in the future for us. There's a pastor in California named Jack Hibbs, and he said, My interest is in the future because I'm going to be spending the rest of my life in it. I thought that was great. I agree with Jack. The future should be very important to us, especially the events coming biblically to us. Because we're told in the scriptures that one day Jesus will return to earth with all of his saints. Actually, the Bible says this many times, but I want to show you one of them. It's in uh, Colossians 3, verse 4. And look what Paul the Apostle said. He said, when Christ, who is our life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. Would you just look at that and think about that for a moment? Because if we are going to appear with him, which is what he says, then we have to go to him first, right? I mean, logically, that makes sense to me. Hopefully it does to you too. And so the way that I understand this is Jesus will take a a generation of his church out of the world, and it's going to happen suddenly and without any notice. Like this picture here. This is sort of what it's going to be like. (laughs) You'll be sitting there on a bench reading a book one day in the park, and then poof, you'll be gone, right? Provided you know Christ as your Savior. So that's kind of exciting, isn't it? We're going to leave this world behind. I am looking forward to that. And so are the writers of the New Testament, by the way. Now, how important is this doctrine? Is this doctrine, do you think, essential to salvation? No. You don't need a correct order of end-time events in order to be saved. It's not on par with the gospel message. But it has a high level of importance because how a church believes this particular thing will affect how it teaches and how it understands the rest of the Bible. It's sort of a filter that a lot of things pass through. And it affects the hope of the church, I think, and the sense of urgency of the church. Let me give you an example. Imagine two Christians. One of them believes that Jesus could take her home today. Not because she dies, necessarily, but just that he will take her out of the world, just suddenly, like I've explained. Now, her friend believes that the church is going to go through the Great Tribulation, okay? So how might you think that their approach to life be different? Our second gal, Christian, she might think, hmm, this is going to get bad. I better start stockpiling. I'm going to go to Costco and buy all their toilet paper, (laughs) all the water, bottles of water. I'm going to need lots of water, stock it in my garage, Ammo, going to need ammo because people are going to try and get my toilet paper, you know, those kind of things, and just kind of prep for the long haul. And I think that that person possibly would be looking for the Antichrist. Who's the Antichrist? Is, is that the Antichrist? Who, oh, this, that might be the Antichrist, you know, that kind of thing. So there's that person. Or go back to the, our, our first friend. She would be saying, this could be my last day here. I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to have a light touch on the world. <laughs> and I, I'm, you know who I'm looking for? I'm looking for Jesus. Because Jesus is going to take me out of here any day. I believe that person would be more hopeful and would have sort of a better, to me, biblical way of looking at life and the world as a Christian. All that said, before we get into the scriptures here, if you hold another view than I do, it doesn't mean that I think that you're a heretic. I don't. And I hope that if you hold a different view, that you don't think that I'm a heretic either. We can disagree on this subject. But I've developed this view of eschatology or end times things over the years. And this is what all Calvary chapels essentially teach, a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And I think it's really important for the life and health of the church. So I'm going to spend a Sunday here talking about this. What I'm going to do is answer three questions today for you as we go through this. 
First, I'm going to answer the question, is there a pre-trib rapture of the church? I'm, I'm thinking you can guess what I'm going to say about that. Secondly, we're going to look at what's, if there is a pre-trib rapture of the church, then what's the tribulation for? And then third, we're going to see what's next. Okay, so let's begin here. We're just going to take a quick peek here in Revelation 4, verse 1, with number one. Remember I said it's, is there a pre-tribulation rapture of the church? So let's find out. Verse 1, and here's what John said. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Okay, I'm going to teach all of chapter 4 next week. That's what I usually do. I just expositionally teach through sections of the Bible, just go through the whole Bible. This time, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to use this verse as sort of a springboard to talk about one doctrinal issue. And I've already said what it is, the rapture of the church. I'm going to kind of take you on a rapture tour of the Bible. Okay? And so you're going to need a Bible today. I hope you're all set here because I'd like you to follow along with me. I'm going to show you a bunch of verses, but I'm also going to take you to a few. And I'd like you to read it for yourself. Don't just listen to me. Read it for yourself because we're going to move around here a little bit. First, let's go back And look at what John said in chapter 1, verse 19, because he gave us an outline of the book of Revelation. It's very helpful. It's a three-point outline, so it's great. First, he said in verse 19 of chapter 1, John had a vision of the things that he's seen. That was Jesus, right? The vision of Jesus. Jesus wanted John to write about that. So that was the first thing. We already covered that in chapter 1. And then he said the second part that he wanted John to write about were the things which are. And those were chapter 2 and 3, the church. And we spent a couple months going through each of the seven churches in Revelation. And now, from this point forward, the rest of the book is the third part, the third part of the outline, which the things that will, must happen take place after this. He says it twice there in verse 1, so he's repeating himself. That term after these things is metatauta. That's the Greek phrase that you maybe you've heard uh, before, but it's talking about future events, things that are going to take place later on. Now, all I have to say, John has not been raptured here. (laughs) He's still on the island of Patmos. He's just getting a vision of heaven in this chapter and the next. This is likely the place in Revelation where the rapture of the church takes place because there's clearly a break between chapters 3 and 4. And I believe it's because in God's plan, the church has been taken to heaven at this point. And John is going to see that. I'd like to give you, before we go on and get in the scriptures more, I'd like to give you some facts or stats about the rapture and that you could start to kind of chew on. Because I think Stats are kind of meaningful sometimes. Here's the first one. There's three of them. The first one is the church is not mentioned anywhere again as being on earth until after Jesus comes back. And then when it is, we are with him. That's the first thing. Secondly, the word church is mentioned 19 times in the first three chapters but it's not mentioned again until chapter 22, okay? And then third, in the tribulation chapters, chapters 6 through 18, there are 28 references to Israel, but none to the church. So I want you to kind of chew on those stats. (laughs) Now, there's no real single verse that tells us that there's a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Sort of like there's no single verse that tells us that there's a trinity. It's like a whole Bible approach to the subject. A pastor friend of mine, he said, it's like trying to solve the timing of a crime. He says you have to seek out the evidence by doing some investigative research to tell you the whole story. And so that's what I'm going to do 
for you today. I'm going to sort of be a Bible detective, (laughs) and you can go along with me and then come to your own conclusions as we go through it. So with that, let's start with the Old Testament, an Old Testament event that I think points pretty plainly to the rapture and a pre-trib rapture of the church. So would you turn to Genesis chapter 19? Genesis 19. This is when God sends angels to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for their sins of immorality. The Lord and two of his angels in chapter 18 pay a visit to Abraham and Sarah. Do you guys remember this? (laughs) The Lord decided to let Abraham know that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, So then this, what we're reading now, is what happens the next day. Okay, When the angels go there. And they pay a visit to Abraham's nephew, Lot, who's a believer. So let's start. Genesis 19, I'm going to read verses 12 through 17. It says, Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? When it says men, it's talking about the angels, by the way. But they were in man form. Have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in this city? Take them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord's going to destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass, when they brought him outside, that they said, Escape for your life! Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Uh, One more verse. Would you uh, go down to verse 22 with me? The angel then says, hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive. If you were to go back to chapter 18, Abraham is upset when he hears about God's plans to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Because again, his nephew Lot, lives there in his family. And so he says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? <laughs> and he then asks God if he will destroy the city if any righteous people are there. Because again, he knows his nephew and his family are there. So Abraham's argument, and it's a good one with God, is this. It wouldn't be fair for God to judge the righteous along with the wicked, because by faith we have escaped the wrath to come. Right? That's a good argument. And it's true. And of course we know from the story that God doesn't destroy the righteous along with the wicked. He removes the righteous. Go back to verse 22 with me, would you? The angels say they cannot destroy it until Lot and his family are physically removed. They sort of have to yank him out of there, though. Did you notice that? Because he's like lingering. He doesn't get it. I love it when the New Testament gives us commentary on these Old Testament stories. And Peter does that with this. He's talking about Lot and how he's a man of God and how he's vexed in his spirit because he lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. And look what Peter says about him in 2 Peter 2. Verse 9, it's up on the screens for you. He said, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. (laughs) In other words, Peter's saying, God knows how to get his people out of a wicked place. He can do it. It's almost as if Peter's trying to convince you and me to believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church or something. (laughs) I thought you would laugh there, but apparently you're not... You guys, is everybody okay? (laughs) You all right? So that's an Old Testament story example of a pre-trib rapture of the church. So the New Testament teaches about this some too. Let's shift over to 1 Thessalonians. If you turn your Bibles now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you might be familiar with this passage. 1 
Thessalonians 4, and let's look at what the Apostle Paul says about it. I'm going to start reading in verse 13 down to 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Oh, good. I don't want to be ignorant, brethren. (laughs) Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then, here's the key, We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Like, I'm so glad that's in the Bible. (laughs) So he says they'll sleep. Now sleep here, don't get confused, sleep is a euphemism for dead. These people have died. And so then the question is, why doesn't Paul just say dead then? (laughs) Well, because for Christians, sleep is a more accurate term. It's a temporary condition. You close your eyes in one reality and awake in another. It would be sort of like if you've ever been a passenger on a long-distance car ride. Let's say that you're a passenger and your your spouse is driving or your friend's driving and and you're you're getting drowsy in Wyoming, you know, because there's nothing to look at and you're starting to fall and then you fall asleep, and then you wake up a few hours later, downtown Denver. (laughs) It's sort of like that. You go to sleep in one reality, and you wake up in another. That's why Christians aren't supposed to be afraid of dying, even though it's painful sometimes. It's certainly painful for those of us who are left behind, but we're not supposed to be afraid of death. And so Paul is trying to comfort these guys because they thought their family and friends who died were going to miss the return of the Lord. They didn't get it. That's why he told him he didn't want him to be ignorant. And then he adds, since he's talking about it, he says, oh, by the way, some of us are never going to (laughs) die. And they're like, wait, what? You see, some living believers will be taken away in a moment of time. If you go back to verse 17 with me, that English phrase there, caught up, translate to, it's from the Greek word harpazo, which means to snatch up. And this is the word that we get the English word harpoon from. So think about that. God is going to harpoon you out of here. And that's not awesome. Guys really like this. Women, not so much. Guys were like, yeah, harpoon me out of here. And that's what he did to Lot, if you think about it. Because remember, Lot was lingering. And they're like, get out of here. (laughs) And by the way, this is not the second coming of Christ. Some people like to think it is. Jesus does not come back to earth to take us away. We go to him first. And again, the Bible says it many times. You could read the one chapter book of Jude because Jude tells us when Jesus returns, the saints come with him. So we have to be with him first. All of us, and I believe this is how it happens. Now, I think most Christians would agree based on this that a rapture does take place. The debate sort of swirls around when it takes place relative to the tribulation, right? So what I wanted to show you is this simple timeline of how I see this happening and how I think biblically it plays out. And here's just a simple timeline. You see on the far left of this chart, we're in the present age, and then comes the rapture of the church. Could happen any time. And then there's seven years of tribulation, which includes the great tribulation in there. And then there's the return of Christ at the end of that. From then on, it's a thousand year millennial reign of Christ, and we will rule and reign with him, the Bible says. And then comes the final judgment, the great white throne judgment of the unbelievers. And then finally, on into eternity. Now, I believe that that's what the Bible teaches. Not everybody sees it the same way, but I wanted you uh, to see that because that's how, what a, a Calvary Chapel view of eschatology, essentially. And I believe that the rapture is going to happen sometime before 
the seven-year tribulation. If you go back with me, look, look at verse 18 and what we just read. Would you check that out again? What does he say there? He says, comfort each other with these words. So I'd like for you to just remember that for a few moments, because I'm going to come back to that and talk more about that. Remember that word, comfort. Paul talks to another church about the rapture of the church in 1 Corinthians 15. And look what he says there to them. He says in verse 51 and 52, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Right? He's talking about dying again. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. The timing there isn't spoken of so much, just the fact that there will be a rapture of the church. And so I have that in there because I want us to just remember wherever we land on this, that it's sudden and it's unexpected and it's surprising. That means that it has to be imminent. I love this because not everybody in Christ will die. Because in a moment, Paul just said, some will be changed. Just like that. Blink of an eye. The dead in Christ, they will rise first. You know, my mom, who died 25, 27 years ago in Christ, she will rise first. (laughs) And then those who are living, I pray it's me, (laughs) you, that we will be raptured and join them to be with Jesus before he returns at his second coming. It's exciting. Isn't this exciting? (laughs) What a hope it gives to a generation of Christian. I hope it's our generation. In the Old Testament, there's not only a picture of it with Lot, but it actually happened to someone. Actually, a couple people, but I want to show you one. And it's in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. Look what it says. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. It's not that crystal clear unless you were to go back and read that chapter, which I would urge you to do on your own is for some extra credit. <laughs> But that chapter is talking about the descendants of Adam. And, you know, you've read those genealogies before. These are usually the ones where we skim read or just completely skip over them. Because they're, we do like, how does this relate to me? And all that kind of thing. So say like Adam begot so-and-so and and they lived this long and then they died. And then they begot so-and-so and and they had this many children and, and they lived this many years and then they died. And in the middle of all that, it says, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. You see, what that means is one faithful man was walking with God, was walking along one day, and then poof, he was gone, like that guy on the bench that we saw earlier, the picture. And I know that's the case because the New Testament provides commentary on this. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, look what the writer says there. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That's so great because sometimes you could read stuff like that and go, oh, was he in trouble? (laughs) No. What separated Enoch from everybody else is he pleased God by faith. (laughs) And by the way, that's the only way that you can please God is to be a person of faith. Oh, and one more thing about Enoch, and then I'll move on to my second point. Do you know when that took place? It was before the flood of Noah. The flood of Noah was judgment upon the earth. And God, in his mercy, raptures Enoch out of the world so he doesn't have to go through that and experience the whole thing. To me, all those things sort of prefigure or predict a pre-trib rapture of the church. So then, the answer, hopefully, that you came to is, is there a pre-trib rapture of the church? Yes, but your mileage may vary. (laughs) Number two, then if there's a pre-trib rapture of the church, what's the tribulation for then? Well, the answer is others, okay? So would you turn back with me a couple chapters to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, And we're just going to look at one verse here. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10. Again, this is Paul writing. And he says, And to wait for his son from heaven, 
whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. I want to show you a few deliver us from wrath to come verses here so that we're convinced that the church does not suffer condemnation from the Lord. Because Jesus, our faith in him, who he is and what he's done, delivers us from wrath. You are made righteous or right with God through Jesus Christ. That's how you avoid judgment. Now, some people will say, well, the great tribulation is not God's wrath. It's just persecution. Not the way I read it. Or some might say, well, it's just the last three and a half years that is the wrath of God. Yeah, the second half is worse, but I believe all of it is the judgment of God. I want to show you here just a quick little chart of the different views of the rapture of the church so that we can kind of have an idea of what people think, right? On the left-hand column, and I'll just read down that one, the pre-trib, which would be mine in Calvary Chapel, they distinguish between Israel and the church and that the tribulation is focused on Israel and the unbelieving world. And I'm going to talk more about that as we go. It's imminent prior to the beginning of the tribulation. And then the believers are rescued from wrath, all of it. The mid-trib, or some say pre-wrath, that kind of is around that same time, say that the church and Israel are all mixed during that time, that the rapture follows three and a half years of the tribulation, so then it's not imminent, and then believers are only rescued from some of the wrath, the great part, great wrath. And then in the right-hand column is post-trib. So this view sees that, that the church is Israel and Israel is the church for the most part. That the rapture follows seven years of tribulation, so then it's not imminent. And that believers are rescued from the judgment upon unbelievers, right? That's what they're escaping. So I wanted to see you to see that there so you, we're kind of all on the same page of what these various terms mean. Those are different views in this, of eschatology in this particular subject. So what's it for then? What's the tribulation for? Well, it's important to understand that the seven-year tribulation, to me, is focused on Israel and the unbelieving world. In Romans 11, Paul the Apostle says that all Israel will be saved. He says that. When does that happen? Has it happened yet? No. Like we have uh, some Jewish people in our church that are believers in Jesus Christ now, praise the Lord. And there's lots of Jewish believers in Christ, but not all. I'd say the vast majority have rejected Christ as their Savior. And yet, when you read through Revelation, God is going to save maybe millions of Jews in those seven years. And the reason is because they are going to inherit the earth like the Bible promises during the millennium. And none of that has happened yet. You see, Calvary Chapel believes and teaches that there's a clear distinction between Israel and the church and that God is not done with Israel yet. He has a plan for them. He's focused on on the Gentiles, the church today. You see, I think what's happened is that many Christians have mistakenly assumed that what is intended for Israel is intended for the church, that we're one and the same. I don't, but lots of people think so. For example, if you think that the church is Israel and Israel is the church, you likely will believe that we will go through the tribulation because when you read through Revelation, Israel is clearly there. I mean, 28 times they're mentioned. So then you have to have a system that fits that. And so some think, well, that's the church then. But I don't think that. Here's something else to consider. All through the New Testament, the church is warned about things like ungodly living and false prophets and persecution for our faith in detail. (laughs) However, nowhere are we told to be ready for the Great Tribulation. Why is that? I mean, think about it. If the plan all along was for the Christians to go through that even part of it, you'd think somebody would have prepared us, but they didn't. We have a detailed account of the Great Tribulation for 13 chapters in Revelation, and he doesn't mention the church one time in it. And so, all that to say, the simple answer is the church is not in view in the Tribulation. We're in heaven. That's why John sees this 
in chapter 4 and 5. I want to remind you of something we already covered in Revelation in chapter 3. But look what Jesus said to the faithful church back then. He said, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which has come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So what does Jesus say he's going to do with the church? Keep us from that judgment, right? The trial, the test. And I think the reason why he says it that way is because people still get saved in the tribulation. So it's an opportunity for people while the judgment is going on. So then the answer again to the question of what's the tribulation for then, the answer is it's for others. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that God could shield us from the judgments in those seven years. Could he do that? Sure. Kind of does it with Israel in Egypt. Remember when they were in captivity there and there were all those judgments coming upon the plagues and so forth in the book of Exodus onto the Egyptians. You know, where it was dark over the whole land, but the Jews had light. Remember that? So he could do that. He could keep us, the, the church, the for people from dying in the tribulation. But he doesn't. He doesn't. Revelation tells us that almost all the saints die. They're either the conditions kill them or their heads are cut off because the Antichrist martyrs them because they won't take the mark of the beast. So in my view, that is not preserving the church. Jesus actually said, unless those days were short, nobody would survive. Here's another one about wrath. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. It's on the screens. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Some people are appointed to wrath. They are because they've rejected Christ. You don't have to, but some people hold on to that right to the very end. But not the church. The church is not subject to wrath. And you know what? Paul, after this, he goes on to say again, (laughs) comfort one another with these words. Now, remember I said I was going to come back to that? So let's talk about that for a minute. Comfort. If you were to say to me, hey, Pastor Troy, you believe in Jesus, you are justified by his blood, but you're going to go through the tribulation. And here's what's going to happen to you, unfortunately. 100 pound balls of fire hail are going to fall on your house. They're going to crush, they're going to maybe kill your grandkids. The ocean is going to be turned to blood. We're all going to be starving. Most of the trees and vegetation will be gone. Your skin's going to be burning off. But don't worry. God's going to get you through it. Now, that does not comfort me one bit, no matter how you package it. But you know what does comfort me? Escaping it all. (laughs) And that's what I think happens. And not because I made it up in my head. It's because that's what the Bible preaches. Now, someone who's sensitive will say, well, what about all the poor unbelievers? Are you just going to rapture out of here and leave them here to deal with all that? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You see, they have the age of grace to repent and trust in Jesus, just like all you have. You know, I want them to be saved. That's why one of the reasons why I do what I do. I try to share the gospel every Sunday when I teach or whenever other, any other time at an event or a conference or whatever. Because, and personally, when I meet unbelievers, because I want them to be saved and escape the wrath of God. But that doesn't mean we have to stay here and suffer along with them. And so I believe that the Bible teaches that you will escape the wrath to come. And here's why. Listen to this very carefully. It's from the prophet Nahum, chapter 1, verse 2. It's on the screen. Look what he says. God is jealous, and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. So who does it say that God reserves his wrath for? His enemies, his adversaries, right? As a matter of fact, he says he's furious. Now, do you think he means he's furious with Christians? No. We are the bride of Christ. I'm not furious with my wife. We're the bride of Christ. My point is that the entire seven years is divine wrath for the enemies. Will people come to Christ? Yes, lots will. Because God is gracious right to the very end. He doesn't have to be, 
Parias. Okay, one more question. If you would turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm going to answer this. What happens next? Okay, what can we expect to happen next? 2 Thessalonians 2. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly when the rapture is. Nobody knows the day or the hour. So we don't set dates, we don't set times. But we're supposed to know that it happens before the tribulation begins. At least that's what I think the Bible teaches. So 2 Thessalonians 2, and I'm going to start reading in verse 3 down to 10. Okay? Here's what Paul said. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, he's talking about the day of the Lord, will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul says pretty plainly there that Jesus will not return again to earth until something happens. And it has to do with this man of sin, the the son of perdition. The Bible explains that that's the Antichrist. And so the Antichrist is going to be revealed and take over and declare that he is God and the world is going to totally buy it because he's going to help what's happening after the church leaves, right? But God's going to remove believers from the earth just prior to him being revealed. I'm going to continue reading now at verse 5. He said, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, lines, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Note that he said there in verse 10, among those who perish. You see, this is not a time for the church to be persecuted. The great tribulation is the time for God's wrath on an unbelieving world. And yes, again, many, many, many will come to faith during those seven years. Praise the Lord. He gives them one more chance. But it is not the time of the church. So Paul says there that the church has to be removed in order for the Antichrist to be revealed. That's why we're not looking for the Antichrist. Because it's part of God's judgment on earth. Remember, Lot was removed before the judgment began. And the Holy Spirit is the restraining force in the believers that's restraining all of the stuff that would happen if we were removed, right? So before all the whole ordeal of the seven years can begin, the Holy Spirit has to remove the the church. The falling away here is the church leaving. That's... What's next? The church is going to leave. The Holy Spirit-filled church is the restraining force. And as soon as it's taken out, then the door is open for widespread disaster. I mean, just think about our world right now. Isn't our world going crazy? Well, imagine if there were no Christians here. I mean, the Bible says we stand in the gap, right? If it wasn't for the church, the Holy Spirit in the church... This place would just cave in. And that's what actually happens in the Great Tribulation. So uh, the believers are keeping it. The Lord through the believers. As soon as they're removed, Paul says, that's when the tribulation begins and the man of sin is revealed. So to wrap up, my argument is that if you look at this in the literal sense and put it all together— you should arrive at the taking away of the church before the tribulation begins. And and we can disagree. We can disagree. But that's the way that I see it. And I think it's better for the church if that's the mindset because we're supposed to live with the expectation that these things are imminent. They're going to happen. You know, I was thinking about, just as an aside, sort of funny story. I'm a few years older than my wife. And... So I've experienced some of the aging things before she has. 
right? And so over time, she would sort of laugh at me because I would do a lot of preventative things because I was starting to get older and I could tell if I wasn't careful, I could hurt myself. For example, she would think it's funny that I would stretch before I would like sweep the garage (laughs) because my back is kind of wonky. And so just a, a, a weird turning, you know, can like, put me out of commission for a few days. So I just started doing preventive things. Or like getting dressed. You know when you're young, you could just get dressed really fast and everything. Well, as you get older, and I'm sure you could testify to this, as you get older, you could kind of like lose your balance when you're putting your pants on and stuff like that, right? So, so my wife would watch me like kind of set myself and everything. And I'm not like a, you know, super old, but still. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, and she's like, boy, are you going to tip over or something? Like, I'm just kind of like watching what I'm doing because I'm, it's preventative stuff. Now, I've been warning her over the years that eventually it's going to start happening to her. And she was like, ah, oh, <laughs> you know. But now she's like, oh, my back, my back. And I'm like, uh-huh, <laughs> you know, those kind of things. So all that to say, these things are imminent. <laughs> and the Lord is trying to warn us ahead of time and to be looking for them, watching for them. To me, the imminent return of Jesus is the best motivation for holy living, for missions, for evangelism. It's one of the greatest cures for Christian laziness and apathy. It should comfort us and give us a sense of urgency about our life. It should make a huge difference in our priorities, shouldn't it? Okay, so that's all I had to say about that. We okay? We still friends? We good? If you believe differently, we still friends? Love you guys. (laughs) Even if you're post-trip, I love you. (laughs) Hey, I want to end my message with one more scripture, something that Jesus said in Matthew 24. Can we read this out loud together as a church? Here's what he said. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready... For the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So whatever your view is, Jesus says, watch, be ready, because we don't know, (laughs) right? He's coming when we least expect it. I'm supposed to be looking for, I'm not looking for the Antichrist. (laughs) I'm looking for Jesus. And you guys should be looking for Jesus too. Amen? I want to give you a question for the car ride home. I like to do this each week with you. Something to discuss amongst yourselves or to think about if you're riding by yourself. Here's the question. It's a simple one. Am I ready for the rapture of the church? Are you? Hope so, Christian. Hope so. I'm going to pray for you in a moment that if you're not ready, I had a gal come up to me after first service and say, I I don't know that I am really. And we pray, you know, it's just she needs to focus what she's doing here. But maybe you're not a believer in Jesus yet and you're really not ready for the rapture of the church because based on what we read in scripture, you're not going. You will stay here, and it's going to be bad. But listen, you can put your trust in Jesus right now and escape. There is no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. God sent his son because he loves you, and he doesn't want you to perish in your sins. And so if you haven't done that yet, can I just urge you, my friend? You know, the Bible says that we plead on behalf of our king that you would be reconciled to God. Would you do that now? Just put your faith in him. He will save you. He will forgive you. God loves to forgive sinners like me and like you. (laughs) And so would you put your trust in Christ? I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to invite you to just pray a prayer along with me. So if you want to do it, you can do it. It's up to you. God's calling you, but you've got to make the decision. You have to open the door. So let's pray. Well, Lord, first I just want to pray if there's anybody here who hasn't put their trust in you yet. Somebody um, watching on the internet or listening on the radio, Lord, that they would just yield to you. You've proved that you love them and that while they were sinners, Christ died for them. And so I pray for that person that they would say something like, please forgive me, God, for my sins. Thank you for warning me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for the hope that I have in eternal life now. And I also pray for my brothers and sisters, God, those watching from home and listening and and here 
in this number, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that we would have our eyes fixed on you and your soon return. Your word ends with Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And I know it's important to the apostles and it should be important to us. So I just pray that we would live with a sense of urgency and it would affect us in a great way as your church. Thank you, God, for the promise that we don't experience your wrath, but we experience your grace. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.